in the distant past, I, I wrote some comment pieces for The Guardian, as, as Hillary was saying. But in recent years, I've spent a lot of time analyzing how the national press and broadcasters, including The Guardian, report on UK foreign policy, Britain's role in the world. And we at Declassified UK have, have recently published several in-depth critical analyses of, of this media reporting. And the basic issue is that there is a massive difference between the reality of that UK foreign policy and how it's reported in the UK media. Maybe millions of readers of The Guardian and its sister paper, The Observer, believe that it offers critical, independent reporting and that it's very different to the right wing billionaire controlled UK media. But my analysis is that The Guardian plays a key role in misinforming the UK public and in upholding the British establishment. Now, I want to present something new today. I've done a content analysis of reporting by The Guardian and Observer on UK foreign policies, covering the two years from April 2019 to March 2021. Uh, I haven't covered all The Guardian's output since there are thousands of articles, but I have looked in detail at several key UK foreign policy issues. And my research identifies five key trends in Guardian reporting, which I wanted to outline today. The first one is that the Guardian's worldview promotes the establishment myths of benign British and American power. So a leading Guardian columnist wrote an article in February listing the world's bad guys. Across the world, he wrote, the bad guys are winning. And his list included Burma, China, Russia, North Korea, Syria, and Ethiopia, but he didn't mention the UK or the US. A few months before that, another influential columnist listed Assad of Syria, Orban of Hungary, Putin of Russia, Bolsonaro of Brazil, Modi of India, Netanyahu of Israel, and Donald Trump as the world's bad guys. But again, not, not the UK. Now, I think these listings are telling and they signify how the Guardian and Observer report on the world and the UK's place within it. The UK is seen as one of the good guys. To the editors of the Observer, post-war Britain has always championed a rules-based international order, they wrote recently. And they claim that this rules-based world order is now under threat from the likes of Vladimir Putin and Chinese leader Xi Jinping. Again, the leaders designated as enemies by the British government, but not from Britain. So when an Observer editorial last May covered the importance of the United Nations, it lamented only Russian, Chinese, and Trump's years of undermining the UN, but again, didn't mention Britain. But the fact is that Britain is also a rogue state when it comes to upholding the rulings and values of the United Nations or any supposedly rules-based world order, uh, as we at Declassified have, have tried to document. What about all those wars, all those British conflicts in places like Iraq and Libya and all the human rights abusing regimes the UK supports, to name just two obvious aspects of the UK's negative impact on the world? This doesn't seem to trouble Guardian writers. To The Guardian, the more the UK does in the world, the better this might be. So Guardian editors recently lamented the government's cuts in overseas aid, because this means we throw away our claim to global leadership. Observer editors similarly want to increase Britain's international influence. If it follows that Guardian editors back a large military budget. They wrote in November last year that the case for a spending upgrade is strong and was even a national priority. A reader of The Guardian would naturally get the impression that Britain is a routine supporter of international law and human rights that occasionally goes wayward. But this rose tinted view, which I think is impervious to the available evidence, also applies to its coverage of the US, the UK's key ally. So The Guardian was brutally critical of just about everything that President Trump did or said, rightly, but it heaped praise on his predecessor, Obama, through all his numerous wars, 
and now writes a stream of supportive and even obsequious articles about Joe Biden and his offer of hope and light, as Guardian editors put it last year. Basically, the paper has shown itself to be largely a devotee of Anglo-American liberal power, with, um, with editors recently welcoming even the opportunity for Boris Johnson to be Biden's military ally. To the Guardian, Trump represented a big break with a mythological past. So the editors claimed uh, in January last year, Washington once championed international law to manage global relations, but under Trump, it promotes the law of the jungle. The faith that observer editors are willing to place on Biden has actually been extraordinary, even by their standards. After Biden's first foreign policy speech as president in February, Observer editors noted that, quote, Biden's way is the diplomatic way, not the way of war, and that his, quote, recommitment to multilateralism represented long-standing American policy objectives. Three weeks later, Biden bombed Syria, ordering airstrikes against Iranian-backed forces in the country. That's the first trend. The second trend that I've identified in the research is that the Guardian doesn't truly cover uh, its own government's role in the world. It doesn't truly cover UK foreign policy. The paper gives a very partial picture of the UK's true role in the world. Whole areas of UK foreign policy are excluded from its coverage. So regular Guardian columnists hardly cover UK foreign policy and reveal even less. But they all seem to write endlessly about the US, badly. If you take the example of Israel and Egypt, so the Guardian publishes dozens of articles on Israel and regularly criticizes its illegal settlements in the occupied territories, and it regularly calls for the UK to recognize a Palestinian state. But the coverage is remarkable for failing to reveal UK policies backing Israel. I could find no mention at all in the last two years of the UK's considerable and increasing military cooperation with Israel which is easily documented from public sources, or of the UK's increasing trade and investment with Israel. It's actually a similar story with Egypt. So again, The Guardian publishes plenty of articles critical of the relentless repression under the current regime of President Sisi in Egypt. And it, does, it, it has had several articles mentioning the UK's failure to condemn Sisi's human rights abuses. But I could find no articles in the past two years detailing actual British support for the CC regime, especially deepening military relations that are again in the public domain. These weren't mentioned in three editorials on Egypt within the last two years. The, the paper's correspondent in Cairo was even expelled from the country in March 2020. It barely made a difference as she didn't seem to notice while she was there that the UK was supporting the regime that she was covering. I found only one passing mention in a single article of 218 million worth of UK arms exports to, to Egypt in, in the recent, recent years. There are plenty of other examples like that of countries very badly covered. I want to come on to the third trend of Guardian reporting, which is that the Guardian rarely investigates or seeks to reveal UK foreign policies. So the Guardian conducts few original investigations into UK foreign policies, and it gives no impression it wants to truly hold the British government to account for its actions abroad. Very few foreign affairs articles appear to be based on freedom of information requests, for example, which are an obvious way to expose government policies. Any media outlet serious about examining UK intelligence and military policies would regularly investigate Britain's key bases, key military intelligence bases in places like Kenya, Cyprus, Brunei, Belize. For example, The Guardian does almost nothing on those places. The paper has published five articles on Belize in the past two years, none mentioning the UK military role there. We at Declassified show the Ministry of Defence is allowed to use one-sixth of Belize's entire territory for jungle warfare training. This was using information already in the public domain. 
On the dictatorship in Brunei, there have been several articles critical of the Sultan of Brunei's stance on stoning gay people, but no investigations into the UK military forces there and how they keep the Sultan in power. And perhaps most astoundingly, despite 170 articles and videos tagged Kenya in the past two years on the Guardian site, I could find no mention of the extensive UK military presence in the country, which involves hundreds of troops, British troops, and 13 separate training grounds available for British troops, which is something that my colleague at Declassified Phil Miller has documented. The fourth trend of reporting. The Guardian covers a small number of issues reasonably well, but often within limits. So different to the right wing UK press, the Guardian regularly covers and takes a critical line on issues like, for example, UK arms sales to Saudi Arabia and other human rights abuses, on MI5 and MI6 collusion and torture, and on a subject like the UK's dispossession of the Chagos Islanders. The paper is also by far the most interested in the British press in covering UK tax havens and Britain's role in global tax avoidance. And also some major historical issues like the British Empire and the slave trade are consistently covered critically. Now, I think it's this coverage that probably explains why liberal readers value The Guardian and regard it as different to the overtly establishment billionaire owned media. That's the good side of The Guardian. But there, there are limits to what the paper covers or reveals, even on these issues that it covers reasonably well. If you take the Yemen war, there have been plenty of articles on the Yemen war and the British arms exports to Saudi Arabia fueling it. And Guardian editors have correctly mentioned the UK's, quote, utter disregard for the lives of Yemenis. But the true extent of the UK's role in facilitating the Yemen war, especially the activities of the Royal Air Force and Arms Corporation BAE Systems in Saudi Arabia has barely been covered in the paper. UK ministers have been complicit in war crimes in Yemen since 2015, but they've been let off the hook as much by the Guardian as the rest of the media. And what happened when a political leader came along who might have transformed UK policy towards Saudi Arabia, towards the Yemen war and, and elsewhere. Well, what happened is that the Guardian and the Observer devoted huge space during Jeremy Corbyn's leadership of the Labour Party to undermine the prospect of a government led by him as he posed the biggest ever challenge to establishment power. The paper's overly, overtly hostile stance towards Corbyn was widely noted and he all but accused him of being anti-Semitic, while consistently demonizing the Labour leadership for allegedly failing to address anti-Semitism in the party. Now, a study by the Media Reform Coalition found that Guardian reporting on anti-Semitism in Labour involved false statements or assertions of facts and a systematic pattern of highly contentious claims by sources that were not duly challenged or qualified in news reports. The Guardian's selective coverage of key issues to promote a political agenda is also illustrated in recent reporting on the UK's new military strategies. So the UK government has recently announced something major and, and deeply worrying. Its new military strategy says the UK armed forces will be, quote, more active around the world to combat threats of the future and be globally engaged, constantly campaigning. Britain's Defence Secretary Ben Wallace said something extraordinary to Parliament just a few days ago. He said the British military will no longer be held as a force of last resort, but will become a more present and active force around the world, moving seamlessly from operating to war fighting. Now, this emphasis on war fighting has hardly been noted by The Guardian. In fact, several of its articles have preferred to lament cuts to the Army, Navy and Air Force. The same complaint actually is the right wing media. This is at a time when the UK has the fourth largest military budget in the world, bigger than Russia. 
So here we have Boris Johnson's government explicitly outlining plans to fight more wars and deploy more military force across the world. But these declarations have been barely or not at all noticed by the country's leading liberal media outlet. So what's the fifth, the fifth trend? The Guardian regularly acts as a platform for the security state. So while the Guardian publishes occasional articles which are usually mildly critical of Britain's intelligence agencies, GCHQ and MI6, it just as frequently runs puff pieces on them. In fact, GCHQ seems to hold a special place at the Guardian. Recent articles are headlined, GCHQ releases most difficult puzzle ever in honor of Alan Turing. And GCHQ aims to attract recruits with Science Museum spy exhibition. It's noticeable that the paper hardly conducts any investigations into the role of the UK's intelligence agencies abroad and criticism of them appears re very rarely in editorials. Now, my colleague at Declassified, Matt Kennard and I have previously revealed how The Guardian has been successfully targeted by the UK intelligence agencies to neutralize its reporting of the security state. And this happened after The Guardian revealed the secret documents supplied by Edward Snowden in 2013. Nowadays, the paper regularly acts as a credulous amplifier of often unsubstantiated claims by British, and intelligent, British intelligence and military figures about the threat posed by Russia and China. The Guardian has actually published 758 articles tagged Russia in the past year alone, a helpful focus on the British state's number one official enemy. It's not that Russia doesn't deserve critical attention, clearly it does, especially in the light of its illegal occupation of the Crimea, its domestic authoritarianism, the likely role of the Kremlin in foreign assassinations, including in Britain. These are obviously serious issues, but Whitehall also has interests in exaggerating the threat to the UK posed by Moscow, and The Guardian, rather than seeking to expose that, appears more willing to act as a conduit for the state's media operations. And the paper's coverage of the war in Syria falls into the same category. So dozens of articles in the paper rightly condemn the Assad regime's war crimes. But there are few which expose the nature of the largely jihadist opposition to Assad. Moreover, The, the Guardian has recently all but excised the UK's own role in Syria's war. The evidence suggests that Britain began covert operations in Syria to help overthrow Assad in late 2011 or early 2012, but I could find no mention in the past two years of Britain's years-long covert war, which was undertaken with its US and Arab allies. The Guardian prefers a different line. Recent articles and editorials have constantly lamented that the UK has failed to act to stop Syria's war ignoring the fact that British covert action very likely, helped, uh, very likely helped to prolong it. What's especially bizarre about this is that the Guardian itself in the past uncovered some of the aspects of the UK covert action program in Syria. So prominent columnist Simon Tisdall wrote just last month that in countries like Syria and Libya during the Arab Spring of 2011, as events turned unpredictable and Islamists got involved, the West backed away in fact, the reality is the opposite. It was then that the Western intelligence agencies began working alongside Islamist forces, seeking to overthrow Assad and Gaddafi in Libya, a policy which served to empower hardline and jihadist groups. Now, it follows with this mode of reporting that The Guardian has run more pieces in the past two years on Russian opposition figure Alexei Navalny than on imprisoned publisher Julian Assange. I mean, Assange is incarcerated in a maximum security prison 14 miles from The Guardian's office. The paper now publishes editorials and articles arguing against uh, extraditing Assange to the US. Much of this likely comes from external pressure. So last October, Wise Up, uh, a solidarity group for Assange, staged a demonstration outside The Guardian's office to protest against the paper's failure to support Assange in the US extradition case. The paper's current support of Assange, which is strong, 
follows years of demonizing it. There are at least 44 articles since 2010 with negative headlines about Assange, and there was an apparent campaign in The Guardian conducted in 2018 falsely casting Assange as an agent of Russia. And it culminated in a false front page fantasy story about Paul Manafort secretly meeting Julian Assange, which remains on The Guardian's website over two years later. It's not difficult to despise Julian Assange, an Observer editorial in April 2019 began, just after Assange had been dragged from the Ecuadorian embassy. And an opinion piece by columnist Hadley Freeman was published comparing Assange to a rotten fish that needed to be thrown out. And despite the implications for media freedom posed by the US prosecution of Assange, and despite the fact that The Guardian itself financially benefited from WikiLeaks' previous exposures, the paper has done almost nothing to investigate the obvious legal conflicts of interest in the Assange case, which so obviously point to a stitch up. So those are my, those are the five trends that in, in my view come through strongly in The Guardian's reporting in, the, in its coverage of foreign affairs over the last two years. I'm conscious I'm not covering everything The Guardian does and I'm certainly not covering its domestic reporting, but I think what, what it shows is this. The Guardian's more critical independent reporting is real on, on certain issues, but it fails to cover key issues and it tends to offer only limited dissent. And this means that its critical takes, when they occur, are usually within boundaries that do not reveal the true role of the government and state in the world, and that actually protect the establishment from proper scrutiny and challenge. The paper's political positioning is on, is on the right wing of Labour and at the mainstream of the US Democratic Party. And this positioning has always su suggested that the Guardian would act to stave off more fundamental change when the time came. And with Corbyn, that was clearly borne out. I think all the evidence suggests that the Guardian can be considered the media representative and the ideological pillar of the liberal wing of the British establishment. It's as much a defender of Anglo-American power and power projection as the right-wing establishment media, and is especially supportive of the UK's foreign wars and interventions and the global influence that it claims that the UK has lost. So the organization Media Lens, which has examined The Guardian for 20 years now, has consistently exposed how The Guardian acts to limit dissent, showing how it performs an effective propaganda function for the state. Media Lens argues correctly, in my view, that the paper's more progressive writers falsely convey the idea that progressive change can be achieved by working within profit maximizing corporations that are precisely the cause of so many of our crises. And the Guardian is coming under more and more scrutiny, um, and illustrated by the book that Des Friedman has just edited, Capitalism's conscience, which, which this conference is, is largely based around. And I think an analyses like this and others show that while The Guardian sometimes exposes how the British establishment works, it largely acts in support of it. And that in recent years, it has largely shredded the capacity that it once had to do more independent and more investigative reporting. And I just wanted to uh, end with this. Overall, I think it's clear the Guardian and the Observer provide a misleading picture of what the UK does in the world. One might think, OK, well, at least the Guardian is better than the right wing media. But my view is that the Guardian's role is just as pernicious as that of the right wing media and may in fact be worse. People are increasingly aware that the right wing billionaire controlled press are routinely slavish mouthpieces of the establishment. But The Guardian is just as bad or worse because it co-ops liberal and progressive minded people into thinking they're being told the truth. Thanks very much.